the service. From the truest mysteries of our time. And so the second day after it occurred, this still remains the most mysterious skyjacking in the Northwest. D.B. Cooper, who hijacked a 727 jet plane out of Portland, Oregon on Thanksgiving Eve, 1971. To the notorious crimes of the Northwest. But something was new, the name Ted. They premeditated design or intent to affect the death of said Lisa Lee. My chance to talk to the press. Contrary and the cases that have gone cold. Three men burst into the business. Their motive was robbery, but it soon turned into murder. Unsolved Northwest is digging through the King 5 archives to help uncover the truth. The name of the robbery suspect has not been released. And up to now, we hadn't heard about any arrests. No. Many unsolved cases are solvable. Maybe you know the very tip that could help crack the case. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Unsolved Northwest. I'm Madison Wade. I'm Steve Solis. Tonight we want to shine a light on some of our state's most mysterious cold cases. First, we want to take you back to the summer of 2009 in Moses Lake, where two pipe bombs hidden inside household objects exploded, killing two men. The two victims did not know each other, but detectives told me the bombs were definitely made by the same person. They say they have new evidence that they're testing, and they hope with the new technology, they'll be able to solve this case. Told this story so many times I have it memorized. It's not something you'd expect in a little town. Hoping story from Moses Lake tonight after a fatal explosion. Something exploded like a bomb. He took a direct hit. Detectives have been perplexed by this for many, many years. And they still need the public's help to solve this crime. We've never been able to establish or pinpoint exactly who could have planted these bombs. We're hoping this one does it. On that morning back in 2008, William Walker, who was a retired electrician from Ohio, came out of his house and he found a battery charger outside of his shop. He took it inside of his shop, and when he plugged it in, there was an IED inside of that battery charger, and it detonated and killed him instantly. What does this property mean to you? It's... <laughs> where he was killed 14 years ago. He wasn't someone you would picture someone would target to kill. Why would someone do that to a 69-year-old man who did anything he could for anybody? We've always believed that Bill was the victim of mistaken identity. It was the second explosion in Moses Lake in two days. No one expected 10 hours later, a second bomb would go off, killing another man. And that was just about five to seven miles away at another home. There was a police scanner that was left in a sack outside of his home. We're not sure how the sack and the police scanner got inside the home, but he brought it inside or somebody brought it, brought it inside, put it on the kitchen counter and it detonated. 53-year-old Javier Martinez Adame was killed instantly. Who's my dad? And he... I want to cry. And that's why I don't talk about it. Because I don't want to cry. Are there tissues nearby? You can go grab me up. Well, like, it's, uh, yeah. It's, I'm going to cry no matter what. Yeah. I'm going to cry no matter what. The entire lot was blocked off by police and personnel, and there was a lot of different agencies there, and they wouldn't let us cross the driveway. Something serious was happening. Two bombs killing two men within 10 hours of each other. 
How could this have happened to two, two, two different men way across town who really didn't, they didn't have any connections? What was the reason behind somebody did this to them? Detectives were never really sure what the connection was between William Walker and Javier Adame. The bomb that killed William Walker and the bomb that killed Javier Adame were clearly made by the same people. It's just unusual and very insidious. Real malice of forethought occurred here. Somebody built a bomb, they disguised a bomb, designed it in such a way that it'd be operated by the victim. Detectives were able to recover a lot of evidence from the scene, and they tell me the police scanner and the car battery charger used in these attacks are items anyone can buy off the shelf, and it wasn't unusual for the victims to have these items. Fireworks powders, flash powders, which are related to fireworks, black powders, smokeless powders, all these things are readily available. Clearly this was the work of someone who was very skilled, had a very sophisticated skill set. There's nothing that's happened since 2008 that's even come close or has any resemblance to the bombings that happened back then. This door was on the shop the day my grandpa was killed. And so we took it off when it got changed and we just put pictures of memories of him on it. It being unsolved, it, it's on the forefront of our memories all the time because we really want to get it solved. Somebody out there knows something. I beg you, please say something if you know something. They deserve justice. We want answers. He deserves to rest in peace. Now, a case in Thurston County where two women are working to find out who killed their mother. The body of Karen Bodine was discovered near Little Rock in 2007. I spoke with Karen's daughter 16 years later, and they are still doing everything they can to finally get answers to their questions. Detectives believe the nude body of 37-year-old Karen Lee Bodine was dumped here along Little Rock Road sometime after nightfall Sunday. Um, the site where they laid my mother after killing her um, is a road I've driven many times as a kid. It is forever marred as a site next to the city dump where someone left a nude body. It seems whoever dumped her did little to conceal the crime. Uh, as it was, a passing motorist on a fairly busy highway at that time in the morning uh, saw her pretty easily. I'm Taylor Bodine, and I am the middle child of Karen Bodine. Yeah, looking back, um, there's no way you can really sugarcoat anything like that. I went through a lot of emotions that, you know, no 15-year-old should be going through um, and that none of my friends were going through, so it was a pretty lonely place to be in. I'm Carly Bodine, and I'm Karen Bodine's oldest daughter. Uh, I was 18 when my mom died. I was a senior in high school. It was really rough for me. Like, I wanted her to be there for my graduation, but instead I went to her funeral. She was there for everything. Like she talked to me before prom and she knew about my dress and she was my best friend no matter what. She had the ends of her hair dyed pink. That was pretty cute. She did that because I had had mine pink and I gotten in trouble at school. It didn't take long for sheriff's deputies to figure out who their victim was. The thin blonde woman with pink streaks in her hair had such a distinct appearance a police dispatcher recognized her description right away. A suspicious death at first. They didn't really have all the facts. They didn't know everything. Unfortunately, it's kind of this way t to this day. Like, as much was known back then, which is not at all, is pretty much the same. You've got a case where, you know, someone's brutally murdered and their body is dumped in the middle of nowhere. All the things that we would use to solve a homicide like that in today's day and age didn't exist back then. There are some details we do know. We know that Lacey police talked with Karen Bodine about 24 hours before her body was found. We also know she was last seen alive at a home in Thurston County at 3 a.m. that morning. When we come back, 
It turns out police contacted Bodine just hours before her death. And sure enough, the Lacey police officer was indeed out with, uh, with our victim. Detectives believe the nude body of 37-year-old Karen Lee Bodine was dumped here along Little Rock Road sometime after nightfall Sunday. A suspicious death at first. They didn't really have all the facts. It turns out police contacted Bodine just hours before her death during what they call a sort of welfare check. So how she was last known at, um, there was a lot of people there. It was kind of a, a party house, you know. It, <clears throat> people were in and out all hours of the night. She, based on the evidence that night, you know, was put through some physical abuse and um, obviously a lot more later. It wasn't just one or two people there. There's more than one person that saw what happened. And they saw, they saw, they know, and they just haven't come forward. The make or break for this case is gonna be someone's gonna remember something, and they're gonna come forward and say, hey, I actually know a guy, or hey, I saw this. And that's going to be that small piece of information that bridges the gap between a solved and an unsolved homicide. Each of our detectives, on top of their already massive caseload, basically gets a cold case assigned to them as a part-time, as a part-time thing to to look back on occasionally. It's not it's not even close to adequate, though. They don't have a lot of detectives, especially for homicides or missing persons. But the fact that they're trying this hard after this long gives us renewed hope. In a way, it consumes me that. She's gone, it really does. But I know she'd also want me to live too, so you know, obviously I do that. We've done our best to memorialize it, to remind people who travel that road every day. It's so pretty. You know, we update it, we keep it fresh, but we haven't forgotten about this and we hope that you don't either. Yeah, I put mine right here with the little baby picture. And we see the community with the things they leave. Oh, you don't? You didn't do that? I didn't do that. Oh, a stranger planted flowers there. So sweet. That's really hopeful to us. And whoever has done that or will do that, um, just know that that's also really appreciated. You're not slick, and I know you're not that smart. I don't care if it's today, 16 years more so. We are getting you. Because you picked really the wrong family. It's not a headline in the news that's gonna go away. It only makes it stronger the more we talk about it. Now on to the mysterious case ruled a suicide. That was until the family of Autumn Stone hired a private investigator who is now questioning the detective work of Seattle PD. Her family believes Autumn was murdered, and they say her killer wants you to believe it's a suicide. The case is reopened. It's been 1,084 days since I lost my daughter. I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> It's whatever makes you comfortable. Yeah. I just don't even know where to start. <laughs> My name is Charity Rush, and I am Autumn Stone's mother. Uh, I am James, and I am Autumn's father. James, tell us about Autumn. <sighs> <sighs> what about her? brightened up your life? Hmm. Everything. She's just very caring and loving and giving and she just had the purest heart. She was 23. Just barely 23. It started off a really, really good day. To Green Lake that day, she had came to me 
the day before and she said, you know, I'm, I'm going to go do this. She was super excited. You know, she was going to have a mommy day. She was going to go and get her a pedicure. As far as I know, um, she was going alone. And I go back to uh, the, the phone call. I got a phone call at 9.45. The phone call that I got at 10 o'clock, August 30th. From the Seattle Medical Examiner's Office. I don't know how to put into words what it's like to lose your daughter. <sighs> they, they found my daughter with, you know, shoelaces around her neck and her sweater was zipped up over the shoelaces. They have no proof. They have nothing saying that there was any foul play there. There's just no way. <laughs> There's no way. I, I don't believe that even the slightest bit that she took her own life. She was engaged to be married. I could show you pictures. She was just so happy. But you can just see her, you know, she was just, she was just super happy and just full of life. In January of 2020, when we initially learned that the case had been closed as a suicide, we reached out to Brent because we were not getting anywhere with the police. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is the area right now. So she walked here. Um, a lot of time for somebody to see her if she was with somebody. Her shoes were found here. Mm -hmm. Were the shoes found over here missing shoelaces? Yeah, they were the same shoelaces that came with the shoes. We went to the manufacturer. Her vest had been zipped up and she had been put in the water. How did she zip up her vest if she had been unconscious? It just doesn't make any sense. None of it makes any sense. How many times do you come out here? Oh. Too many. <laughs> I just look for answers. I don't have any. There's enough evidence that that he's found that it, it gave us the ability to go back to the police and say, look, we need to open this case again. And that's what they did. Autumn Stone's parents tell me they believe she was murdered. When I reached out to Seattle PD for insight on this case, I was told it's an open case and they couldn't release any information as it pertains to their investigation. My most recent inquiry to Seattle PD went unanswered. This is our file that we've been keeping um, it has anything and everything related to my daughter's death. I don't believe that it was a random act. I think it was an act of passion and, and it was to silence her. And unfortunately, she's a statistic at this point and I'd like to change that. What do you think will break this case open? DNA. I do. I struggle with it every day. Uh, yeah, it's hard. The pain doesn't go away. You know, we just want answers. But even then, it's going to be uh, something I deal with every day for the rest of my life. <laughs>nearly 32 years ago. A Shoreline College student vanished on her way to work. The investigation into her disappearance revealed a hidden life and several surprising suspects. Our Unsolved team explored the cold case of 19-year-old Wiki Fung and the surprising secrets that her loved ones were left to untangle. somebody taking your sister away from you, you don't heal. It's, it's, you never heal. I mean, it's like living in hell.
We're still thinking about her and that we're hoping someone out there know what's happened. I mean, someone does, um, and maybe can help us find her, bring her home for my mom. I feel hurt. And today, it's just anniversary ceremony. What the monk is doing is just chanting her name, and that wherever she's at, they hope that she's at peace. I'm just gonna put this around your collar, if that's all right. All right, and we're good to go. Yeah, I responded to their apartment. I have a vague recollection of it, just that I was called there on a call and talked to the family, got the information. This was just one of the flyers that was sent out by our police department at the time when we were searching for Wiki and investigating the case. She had left home in the Linwood area and uh, gone to Shoreline Community College where she was dropped off there reportedly by her current boyfriend at that time. And then from there was gonna be going down to downtown Seattle. She worked at the federal building. She did not show up to work. After she went missing, we realized that they've been dating for two years. He was married. She was 17 when they met, and he was 27. She wanted him to leave his wife, and he keep promising her he would. Did the boyfriend have an alibi? Uh, he had an alibi that he was at work. It's not proved or disproved whether he was or wasn't there. Wiki's boyfriend did give a statement to police, but police could never find any evidence to support his stories. Police also tell us that after giving that statement, the boyfriend failed the polygraph test. Coming up next. It was a convoluted story of victimization. Our detectives made a number of efforts to corroborate any of those storylines or those people, and they found nothing. After she went missing, we realized that they've been dating for two years. He was married. She wanted him to leave his wife, and he keep promising her he would. The boyfriend failed the polygraph test. It was a convoluted story of victimization. Our detectives made a number of efforts to corroborate any of those storylines and those people, and they found nothing. So I think those storylines were disproven. Asian culture, we don't really have therapy. We don't talk openly. We try to hide everything because what people think of us is very important. Do you have any plans, as best you know, to re-interview the boyfriend? Not currently, no. The case is not being actively investigated. It's not closed. It's still an open case for us. This is an age-progressed photo that uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children did on Wiki, what she would be presumed or estimated to look at, look like today. We do not want people to forget about her. She still have a family that love her very much, that wants her home. Every time we do this, it's like she's alive again to us. I don't give up hope and I'll keep going even after my mother's gone and after I'm gone, my daughter will keep going. Thanksgiving Day in 2002. Friends and family remember the horror they felt when a gunman opened fire on their holiday gathering. For a 19-year-old woman, and a five-year-old boy, it would be their last Thanksgiving. The case remains unsolved. 
but survivors are still hopeful for answers. I sat down with the new detective for the Tacoma Police Department assigned to the old case. It's a feeling I get when it's foggy out. Instantly reminds me. Two other relatives, brother and sister Jeff and Harmony Spencer, are recovering from bullet wounds. The motive, unknown. Uh -uh. It's surreal. I mean, there's moments when I can see it all so clearly, like it just happened. Because it just, it stays in your mind. It stays in your heart. There was a lot of people in that room. There was probably at least 20 people in the basement, probably all feeling the same way as I was, just scared. It didn't seem real, but it was at the same time the most real thing I've ever been through. She was very sweet and down to earth, funny, and had this infectious laugh that she was willing to try just about anything. It's a memory that I always, always have with me. We know that Jeff Spencer was dating Kimberly. Kimberly was a student at the University of Washington. Her family's from Hawaii, so she didn't have any family in the Northwest. She was shot and killed and died in his arms. This was a big story at the time, 20 years ago, uh, and King Five covered it extensively. Uh, not only did we cover it, but we spoke to Jeff Spencer 20 years ago uh, on King, talking about the moment that his girlfriend died. I'd always wanted to tell her that I loved her before, and then I never did, and then until that night. I could still remember just looking at her face and holding her, and then she was and, but she was dying, so I just held her and I told, I told her, her I love you. you. Dozens of volunteers and police are canvassing Tacoma neighborhoods with flyers, offering a $26,000 reward for information. Um. I just, as somebody that's completely innocent, has no involvement in anything, and, um, and you can't do anything about it. This grandfather's heart is ripped apart as he looks at the smiling face of Jeremy Bay and Thavong. <laughs> Sweet kid, five years old, just had his birthday. Now he's dead. There's nothing we can do. Well, detectives seem clearly uh, upset and connected with this case. Do they have any leads? So. Early on, investigators came out and they said that they believed this was gang-related, possibly targeted. Obviously, the boy that was killed was an innocent victim. They believed that the young woman was also an innocent victim in this. The Spencer family maintains all these years later that this was totally random, and they say they can't imagine who would do this to their family. Never in my wildest dreams would I have ever imagined the scene that was downstairs going on, the upstairs we were oblivious to, other than the noise. Justice has been slow for Kimberly and Jeremy as police continue to search for a suspect. A 70s or 80s Ford dark colored pickup with a white canopy. But authorities have little else to go on, nor are they speculating if this crime is connected to a different drive-by shooting at this same home two years ago. It's uh, maddening to know that there's people in Tacoma that know they're probably within five, ten miles of us right now that know. The first couple of years, there was so many things I wish I could have changed. Oh, if I would have done this, then maybe people wouldn't have died or if I would have done something else that day. The guilt that you feel from losing people that you love, that's um, tough.
It's a mystery that goes back some 32 years. A missing persons case turned homicide that rocks Nahomish County. What happened to Kathy Dobson, who family and friends called by her maiden name, Dawson? The young Everett mother disappeared at the age of 24. Joyce Taylor talked to her shattered family, still searching for answers. The cemetery is in Marysville. I mean, she's right along the pathway. So I just park the car on the pathway and I take a few steps and you know, there are stones right there. It, it's still a tragedy 30, year, 30 plus years later. So the biggest question now is who actually saw her last? My name is Robert Dawson. Um, I'm the brother, the oldest brother of Catherine. She was my little sister. Tell me about Kathy. She was the baby that, you know, kind of looked after. She was a great person. She was always very happy. My name is Lynn McKee, and I am the mother of Catherine Lynn Dawson. She loved horses, dogs. Um, she showed dogs. She got along with everybody. She was a street kid um, and trusted everybody. Family members say Kathy was involved in drugs. She struggled with addiction and she hung out with known drug dealers. In fact, the last time Bob spoke to her, she was in jail on drug-related charges. Sometime after she got out of jail, she says, I plan on coming over and seeing Eva on the 27th of June when I'm, you know, I'll be out by then, you know. We never heard from her. She would phone me constantly during the week, said, you know, Eva's birthday was coming up. I'm Eva Dawson. And she wanted to have a birthday party. My mother is Kathy Dawson. When she didn't phone back, I knew something was wrong. Um, she just never showed up. It's been sad and just, it hurts my heart. Coming up. About 30 investigators are involved in this tedious hands-on search. And we heard this story being released on the news. December 1992, finally a break in the case. She says, I plan on coming over and seeing Eva on the 27th of June. We never heard from her. When she didn't phone back, I knew something was wrong. It's been sad and just, it hurts my heart. Investigators are involved in this tedious hands-on search in this illegal garbage dump. They say it's too early to tell. If and we heard this story being released on the news. I knew in my heart that it was her. The skeleton found in this garbage dump is all that's left of this woman, 24-year-old Katherine Dobson. Her killer left her body here sometime between June 20th and July 17th. People come in here and they throw car parts, furniture parts, and general trash. And it's difficult for the detectives to find uh, well, what's evidence and what's non-evidence because of that. It drove me crazy that they labeled her. This club, the Deja Vu in Everett, is where the victim worked as a topless dancer until her disappearance in June. <sighs> dancer from Deja Vu. They never said that she was a mother, a daughter. Investigators still aren't sure if her work here has anything to do with her death. Wasn't right. She was a human being. Almost a year later, December 1992, finally a break in the case. Informants tell prosecutors that Kathy's murder was a hit job ordered by Yakima-based drug traffickers who thought Kathy was a snitch. The enforcement end of, the, of that organization uh, picked her up from jail and then she was gone, taken from us. Were you surprised?
honest when they let them go? Yes. Because I, in my gut, I thought they had something to do with it. Do you still believe that? Yep. Of course, DNA wasn't there at the time, but we have DNA now. Why, why can't it, they get solved? somebody to pay for their crime. Fess up. Give us some clues. I just, I just wish I got to know my mom. Heartbreaking when I look at Eva because I see my sister. I randomly go up to Marysville and see my mother's gravesite. It gives me a little peace, you know. I talk to her. Well, I talk to her about her kids. I give her updates on her kids. Yeah, sometimes I'll catch myself just like talking to her. I don't really know what I'm talking to, but. She was just a wonderful sister, a wonderful mother. Yeah, that's how she should be remembered. It's not fair. It's just not fair. Nineteen-year-old Sarah Burke was killed on one of the busiest streets in Bremerton, and somehow her murder is still unsolved. I talked with police who say they have a theory, and they think a serial killer may be to blame. Everything happens for a reason. Nothing happens by chance or by means of good or bad luck. You can make of your life anything you wish. Create your own life and then go out and live it. I would just, I would just like to say that um, I'm still heartbroken to this day. And uh, I have a hard time time dealing with this at, at sometimes. She was our princess. We we definitely miss her. My name is Chester Burke, and uh, my relationship to Sarah's is I'm her father. She was just a, a bubbly type person. You know, she had a lot of energy, go-to energy. It wasn't really anything that she couldn't accomplish. It. She was just very personable and very friendly to anybody and everybody that she met. I didn't find out anything about it until the police came knocking on the door. He mentioned that he had Sarah outside. And I thought, oh great, you know, what, what, what happened? You know, what, what she done? She gotten into kind of some kind of trouble? And uh, no, he said that she was in a body bag and I broke down. She was just like anybody her age. She was texting on her telephone and heading to her boyfriend's house. She was interrupted in her life on the street corner in Bremerton on one of the busiest streets in our city. My name is Martin Garland. I'm a detective with the Bremerton Police Department. I have been working on the Sarah Burke case since 2011. Let's go down here. So this is literally the spot in the street where Sarah was found. Um, was here, we're less than half a block away from where she had intended to go that night to visit her boyfriend. And she encountered somebody at the mouth, to the, at the mouth of this alley that uh, that killed her and left her in the street dying. That person then fled down this alleyway, according to witnesses. There didn't seem to be a motivation for the killing other than the killing itself. There was no robbery involved. Um, there was no sexual assault or anything like that.
Bremerton police have this theory. A serial killer was on the loose because of three attacks that happened within a very short time span of each other. Sarah was the first to be killed. Then just a month later, a man was attacked just a couple blocks away from where she, her body was found. And the MO was very similar, but that man survived. And then there was a third victim. Her name was Melody Brannon. She was 61 years old. Her death happened exactly nine months after Sarah's murder. We had these three instances, the two women that were killed, the gentleman that was stabbed but survived, and they all happened within a time period of a year. Nothing within 10 years before that or ever since then have we had anything similar. The man who was attacked, he was able to provide police with a lot of information, description of the attacker. Police are looking for this man in connection with three attacks in nine months, two of them homicides. Which then helped police with this composite sketch. The suspect is described as a light-skinned black male. This was a serial killer they were looking for. Detective Garland and his force held a lot of community meetings because a lot of people were really scared to walk alone during that time. They walk everywhere, so kind of kind of makes you want to stay home more. And while police have this theory of a serial killer, Sarah's dad has a different theory. In talking to Chester Burke, he's not so sure. I think it had to be somebody that she knew in a group of friends, or maybe it could have been some stranger that asked her for something she wasn't willing to give to them. We are exactly one tip away. We have had a number of suspects in this case, um, a number of those are still viable suspects. We just need somebody to come forward. It's been so many years. We're still hanging on to the hope that we will someday know who or what or why. I love the line, if someone loves you, love them back unconditionally. If someone hurts you, betrays you, or breaks your heart, forgive them. I wish, I really do wish we, we could uh, go back and this never happened. And, uh, go back to the family that we once were. The mother of a 29-year-old woman who was found dead by a creek near Maple Valley almost three years ago say she's confident investigators will find her daughter's killer. Serena Turner's death was originally called suspicious, but now detectives are investigating it as a murder. Serena tried to stay as happy as possible, which she was always known for is like always smiling. She was the goofy one. She talks to everybody. She was very protective. Anything happened, she tried to play the big sister. My name is Rashawn Turner. My name is Patrice Reddick. And I'm the mother of Serena Turner. And my sister's name is Serena Turner. She had her ups and downs in life, but you know, that's just life with anybody. Serena always wanted to be the June Cleaver in life. She wanted to be that housewife with a lot of kids, and that was just her. That's what she wanted. 29-year-old Serena Turner was, by all accounts, full of potential. But all of that changed in December of 2020. That night, she had just walked out the door. She said she'll be back. She was headed to another county, and she ended up calling and said, oh, mom, you know, I'll just see you guys tomorrow. And because we were supposed to go to church that Sunday, but she never came home. He's driving westbound on Highway 18. He's just a little bit east of Jenks Creek. The detective ends up circling back around, pulls into that little dead end road, gets out to investigate, see why this car was there. He walks to the back uh, where he saw the car and finds Serena in the embankment. That's when Serena's mom gets the phone call that changed her life. 
It took me almost a year to stop playing it over and over in my head because it wouldn't go away. I got the phone call. I was actually at work, and when my mom called me, I didn't think it was real. I'm just like, I don't believe this until I see her body. You see a sibling one day, then the next they're gone. That was pretty hard. I just wonder who could bring their self to do that to any human being. That's what bothers me the most. Why do you feel it's important to talk about it now? Well, now I feel like it's important because I need to speak for myself, let my own words be heard, let my face be seen. The King County Sheriff's Office is not calling this a cold case. They say it's war, but say they need the public to come forward with any information as to who may have killed Serena Turner. Everything in the dark always comes to the light, and I'm a firm believer of that. We'll never get Serena back, but you know, everybody got to be held accountable for their actions. We want this to just come to an end. Let her get her peace. Let our family get the peace that we need. Hundreds of missing person cases in our state don't have a key piece of evidence in their file that could make all the difference. This year we introduced you to a Puyallup tribe member missing for over a year who was identified with this evidence in just minutes. She was missing. We didn't hear anything from her for a long time. From June of 21 till, till the beginning of this year, I was searching and screaming and looking and just going nuts trying to find her because it was just nothing. I had these things posted up all over the place. I was looking at all of the food banks all the places up from Hilltop to everywhere, even down in Olympia, I was calling all the police departments. My name is Carrie Gordon, and I'm the program manager for the Washington State Patrol's Missing and Unidentified Persons Unit. The tribal liaison who works for our agency reached out to my unit and said, how do I get family reference sample DNA kits? We understand that DNA is, is the flashy and the most advertised or getting the most attention. It can run upwards of three to $5,000 to process that DNA and get it, get it uploaded. And time consuming, you're talking six months to a year. At the same time, we looked up Bessie's record and we said, you know what, she doesn't even have dental on file, so that should maybe be step one. Any type of dental work you've had done, it shows up on an x-ray and in, in, in a metallic form, and everybody's restorations are different and unique. You, you caught this one right here. Look at this dip right here in there. That's unique to her. You know, no, nobody else is gonna have a restoration that looks just like that. My name is Kyle Tanaka, I'm a dentist. So what we're looking at is dental records, basically dental x-rays. This is the missing person that was in the NCIC system. And these are the missing person's radiographs. The dental was uploaded into, like I mentioned, the, the NCIC computer. Um, and the coding generated a cross-match report, which we get every single morning. So taking a look at the missing person's radiographs to the unidentified person's radiographs, and we get a match. And the very first record on the cross-match report was an unidentified out of Washington State and he called me um, while I was out of state in a hotel room and said, we have, we have a match. Um, and I asked for the missing person's name and he said, uh, Bessie Handy. And I said, I just sat down and I said, oh my God, Bessie. But the key to that is that the information was in the system. Uh, if these records are not in the system, there's no way to possibly make that match. But I called our tribal liaison, Patty, because I know Patty had a really close relationship with Bess Bessie's mother. And I told her, I said, we identified Bessie as, as un unidentified out of Seattle. It was just heartbreaking, but it, it, 
it solved the answer to my question of why isn't she, why haven't we heard anything? It's important work, but at the same time, it's frustrating that she had to be there for so long unidentified. But we were happy that we were able to give her mom some, some answers to where her daughter was. Sorry. So I spent almost two years with hope, and then that hope was crushed. But the answer was given to me, finally. She was in a, a homeless encampment fire in downtown Seattle. The other victim of the fire was ID'd right away. Uh, Bessie remained unidentified. The dental processing in general is such a, a misunderstood. They can make an identification um, from, to a missing and unidentified within minutes, and it's no cost to law enforcement in the state of Washington. Dental records are not antiquated, as we hear quite often. So Bessie's case is a good example of the fact that the system does work. They still work. They are still successful. If she was already gone, and I'm out here running around like a wild chicken. Well, I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people out there that, you know, wish they had an answer. How has your life changed? since February 2021 and June of 2021? It's not the same, you know. Her life has been broken off, but, you know, I just, I just have hope that, you know, I'll see her again someday and all the torment and everything is gonna be gone. You know, she's in peace. To learn about the latest case, get updates on past stories and more, subscribe to receive updates from the Unsolved team a couple times a week. Text the word UNSOLVED to 206-448-4545. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Unsolved Northwest. We have covered just some of the thousands of unsolved cases in the Pacific Northwest. You can see our full series on king5.com. Have a good night.